Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Cluestick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time thanks to your generous support, shares and views with multiple uploads every week to help share the rich history of monsters, locations and mythologies of D&D. Today, something less ordinary for Dungeons and Dragons players but entirely familiar for Magic the Gathering players, a type of creature that is both simple in concept and extremely complex in its potential. A creepy pest in small numbers, a horrific and unstoppable swarm, a horde in massive numbers. Today we are going to be bringing you slivers to D&D. The material I'm basing this on is a rather in-depth 58 page PDF omnibus of slivers called the Shrill Hive created by Daniel North, posted on Reddit but also available uh, open game license content on Home Brewery. My hat is off to you Daniel, this is uh, excellent work. Artwork of course is from the Magic the Gathering cards for the most part. Link to this document can be found in the video description text down below. Slivers were originally designed by Mike Elliott and they were inspired by the card Plagrat from uh, Magic the Gathering Alpha sets. First, what is a sliver? Well, this is a complicated question because slivers are supremely adaptable and they changed a fair bit over time, which makes them very interesting as a research project, I can tell you. Uh, going into this without much understanding of what the slivers was, was uh, challenging because I had to keep changing my narrative of the script as I was uh, researching. I kept rewriting bits as I learned more. Drawing on the Magic the Gathering wiki and other sources, a fairly comprehens comprehensive history of the slivers tells us that they first appeared as creatures with an armoured vertebrae body with a long bifurcated whip-like tail, one arm with a single talon for a hand, and a head with an armoured crest like an insect hive species, the sliver's individual appearance was related to the specific role each had to offer its hive, and in that ability to adapt to suit a need or a condition, well, I don't know about you, but I've been outright murdered by slivers in Magic the Gathering card games many, many times, particularly in the old days. However, we are looking at them as D&D &D monsters today, and this is not a discussion about their traits in the card game. Special thanks to the excellent articles by Rei Nakazawa and the many contributors to the wiki page on slivers. Okay, let's find out where slivers come from in the multiverse. Slivers first appeared on the world called Wrath, which is an artificial create, artificially created world. Wrath is a giant jigsaw puzzle made up of pieces of other worlds thrown together like a patchwork quilt, which had an enormous quantities of extruded flowstone, a sort of nanobot uh, substance generated from its central stronghold. One of the Phyrexian leaders, leaders uh, the leaders are called Evancars, Wrath was uh, used as a staging point where they could uh, gather before invading the world of Dominaria. Bearing in mind that Magic the Gathering multiverse is similar to the Dungeons and Dragons multiverse, D Dungeons and Dragons multiverse, in that the planet is sometimes called a plane, even though it may occupy the same prime material plane, but is separated by a stupendous distance from other worlds accessible by magic travel. It may as well be located on another dimension for all intents and purposes without magical travel. It's just impossible to get between these worlds. So Wrath was not within the physical travel distance through normal space to Dominaria. It was located in a parallel dimension. Travel between the worlds was achieved via magic. Wrath grew steadily in size and mass, and at some points... The uh, extra mass contributed to a crossover where the two dimensions merged in places, allowing unfortunate Dominarians to simply walk into the hostile environment of Wrath. The Stronghold is an incredible structure suspended above a city uh, inside a volcano, the City of Traitors, before being transported to Dominaria itself. Wrath was the creation, uh, it is sometimes, it is commonly believed, of a super powerful figure named Yorgmoth formerly a Republican eugenicist from the ancient Thran Empire. If anything good can be said about Yorgmoth is that he discovered that overexposure to magical power stone radiation causes a disease called uh, Pthysis. Anyway, but otherwise he uh, has always been very focused on reshaping living organisms, seeing living things as marvellous machines to be tinkered with. Over the centuries, Yorgmoth has done all manner of really vile and evil things, such as creating and unleashing horrible plagues just to study the effects on living population. He has also attracted uh, like-minded apprentices, such as the Dominarian called Volrath, who became the shapeshifting and phyrexianized, or basically a techno necro cyborg transformed leader of the world of wrath by the way yorgmoth himself is extensively modified via eldritch science and has 
and he's nothing like his original form. I'll say he fits very snugly into the category of an elder evil of Dungeons and Dragons, easily the match of a demon lord in power. I might even do a video on him on him at some stage. Slivers probably did not originate on Wrath. How could they? The place was artificially created. Wrath was literally made of massive chunks of other worlds, so nobody really knows where that world, their first uh, simple form, evolved on, or if whatever remains of it still bears any kind of life. What is clear is that they were not created from scratch by Rolf Wrath. His attempt to create an entirely artificial sliver was less than impressive, as it lacked one of the major aspects of sliver biology that made them so formidable, which, uh, which is their ability to share traits with one another in a cumulative fashion. What it did do, though, was allow Valrath to use that sliver to infiltrate the sliver colony and begin to subvert its will. The history of the species, though, gets way weirder as time goes on and occasionally goes kind of backward. Uh, I would say that they have more in common with the dreaded mind flayers in that regard, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Sliver ecology is based on the hive. The hive is based on the queen. The queen, in many ways, is not a separate entity from her offspring. They are extensions of her. Much like the elder brain of the illithid serves as its controlling overmind of the mind flayer colony, but the mind flayer colony is enhanced by using the overmind to communicate gestalt um, with all of each other as one. The Queen has her own will, and there have been examples where the Queen has been reasoned with. This first colony of slivers and its Queen was a species of hive-minded mesomorphs or shapeshifters. They needed to remain in reasonable close proximity to each other, and when not otherwise engaged in any activity, they would huddle together clinging to huge stalactites. They all share a hive mind, as if all slivers were using a communal brain. While they're not telepathic with all species, they can read other slivers with complete accuracy. Each individual is born with certain qualities or powers, and when another sliver reads that sliver, they can share those powers. Proximity, though, is very important. Slivers can't read each other over great distances. The original colony of slivers were thought, was thought to have been destroyed when the stronghold was transported directly over the top of the Urborg volcano. The sliver colony underneath the stronghold was flash fried. Certainly the queen did not survive and the sliver species was out of the picture for a um, hundred years. But then along came this thing called the Riptide Project and the species called the Cephalids who partnered with the Dominarian humans to advance the magical arts. And this uh, in this time of intense and, dare I say, reckless research, they went to Urborg and discovered some sliver remains, which they took back to the laboratories on the continent of Otaria in the world of Dominaria. Uh, wouldn't you know it, the freshly revived sliver species rapidly multiplied, adapted and went on an epic rampage, because the cephalids were not aware that the species required a hive queen to control them, and also because life uh, finds a way. Thanks to their instincts, power sharing abilities, and the multiplication abilities of the brood sliver, any wizards who weren't driven out were reduced to desperate survival tactics. And in the middle of all this, um, as with any other event in Otaria, was the Mirari. The Mirari was an extremely potent magical amplification artifact which was kind of like a ticking time bomb waiting for a trigger. Its magical waves not only helped along the growth of the slivers, it also called out to them like a siren song. Lost and confused, these uh, swarm slivers mistook the Mirari's pulse for their deceased queen's call. So they were much more attracted to the mystical orb, um, and pretty much like anywhere else in Otaria. Thus, the majority of this new breed was at the centre of, um, right by the Mirari, when this magical overcharge warp event happened that created the entity called Corona. The massive magical power surge that of, of that event was too much for the slivers that had gathered there, so for the second time the magical cataclysm wiped out a huge number of slivers, almost wiped out their species entirely. But just as the Mirari event fused two beings into Corona, it also mutated a small group of slivers, fusing them into the ultimate manifestation of the hive mind called the Sliver Overlord. And in the battle that happens, hence uh, the Overlord eventually got killed and all of his sliver uh, survivors got killed off as well. The plot thickens for the slivers though. It is generally believed that after Corona's death that the Overlord was separated. 
uh, and the slivers lost their leadership. However, the slivers that survived the apocalypse caused by Corona's destruction and a few other breeds that were time-shifted into the present by violent upheavals of the time stream were able to flourish on the dying world of Dominaria, which was going through a period much like the world of Athos of the Dark Sun campaign setting where a world drained of magic and vitality. It's a dying world. Even the survivors, or ever the survivors, the slivers continued to multiply and mutate into new forms. Some of these new breeds mimicked traits of other life forms in the multiverse. The vampiric sliver fed on the life essence of its prey with its um, strengthening itself in return. The gem hide sliver adopt, uh, adapted an ability to enable it to harvest magical power and vitality from a remarkable variety of sources. It became basically a lens, a catalyst. Basal slivers possess the innate drive to sacrifice themselves to provide for their nest mates. Similar thing to the way that uh, these beings called thrulls are created on the world of Ravnica out of dead flesh to serve as sacrifices for dark rituals. Another new strain present during this time was the Shadow Sliver, trapped between two worlds when the nest within the bowels of Volrath's stronghold was overlaid on Urborg. Presumably, this breed was a terror to the Rathi tribes who were also caught in the overlay in their own home plane in the City of Traitors. So um, there was an overlapping of planes that created a sub-dimension where these people were trapped along with the, uh, the Shadow Slivers. Without the leadership of their queen, these sliver swarms raged across the plane, largely unstoppable when gathered in enough numbers. The destruction caused by the slivers was not necessarily malevolent. The hive-minded creatures only sought a new queen, new leadership, to guide their, nu their numbers. Uh, without a central direction, they just didn't know what to do, so they were operating on base instinct and survival. For a time, the swarms were controlled by a couple of planeswalkers uh, who used their abilities to basically placate the swarms and keep them under control. Then the somewhat tragic, quite evil individual called the Weaver King used his mind control powers to take the place of the Hive Queen figure and used the slivers to wage a war on the planeswalkers, uh, planeswalkers who were keeping them in check. Um, the Weaver King has got a tragic, horrible story all of his own. He was experimented on by the Phyrexians. Well, the Weaver King was defeated, and the Slivers went back to their swarm state. However, the ever-adaptable and mutable Slivers were evolving, and their hive mind is slowly becoming sentient and self-aware, negating further need for a queen. This became quite important when the artifact used by the Phyrexian Evancars to originally control the Slivers, called the Hive Stone, was rediscovered in the ruins of the Stronghold. Honestly, people should just stay away from those ruins. The artifact connected the user to the hive mind outright, uh, but now the hive mind turned the tables and used the hive stone to control whoever activated it. There is another world, another plane where the Magic the Gathering universe, uh, multiverse called Shandahar, and a colony of advanced slivers were cr um, there created the Skep. Um, as their central hive nest. These slivers must have been transported there by the magical time and space warping explosions on Otaria. Well, that's my best guess. Unless um, these were the original slivers, maybe. Anyway, the Shandaharan slivers have gleaming gem-like eyes and hair, more like squirming tentacles or a jellyfish or a polypod. Many still have a bestial appearance, but a few could generously be considered humanoid. All are covered with chitinous plates that glisten and slide about like oiled pieces of machinery. They use a, a chittering speech, and they are divided between the human-sized less brood with tails and singular claws, and the primes, which are bipedal and humanoid, looking like other sentient races of Shandahar. Um, or Shandalar. One sliver, the Hive Lord, rules over all the slivers of the Hive, and this Hive Lord is around 20 times, times the size of a human. And that is the history, in a nutshell, of the slivers. But... What are they like as monsters for Dungeons and Dragons? Well, for that, we turn to the Shrill Hive based, uh, created by Daniel North. Slivers prefer to nest in hive, uh, their hives in areas naturally abundant in heat and vitality, or has been the case at times in areas of excesses of magical energy. Now, if you are using slivers from the Magic the Gathering unit multiverse, it's unlikely that the slivers have a queen with them. And it's perfectly fine to simply have a random assortment of slivers, most of them just basic soldiers, who may exhibit some shared trait from a random mutation located within their particular swarm. 
this is fine. You can handle this very easily using the mob combat rules in the Dungeon Master's Guide. Players going up against this, this sort of a swarm will learn very quickly that taking out the weirdest looking sliver in a group will dramatically shift the odds in their own character's favour. The other option is that the slivers can transform into some sort of a queen gestating proto-queen, and if they find themselves without one, the new queen will simply take over the swarm to create a new hive. This may even be a random mutation within the swarm. Either way, the hive has the capacity to reform even after the queen has been destroyed, so it may be necessary to totally dis exterminate all the slivers to truly end the threat. Sliver hives may exist without a queen. If the swarm has developed a sentient hive mind, this is the, probably the worst case scenario, as the more individual slivers are added to the hive mind, the more capable and intelligent it becomes. Daniel North writes that in the early stages of a hive's development, it is imperial, uh, imperative to send out hunting parties, collecting biological material for the hive to consume so that it can produce deadlier slivers. The range of abilities that a hive can obtain are only limited by its available food source because drones are vital in gathering food sources, taking care of and building nest and maintaining the hatchery and tending to the queen. They are the type of sliver produced the majority of the time and will be the first kind produced if the total population has been drastically reduced suddenly. So you're more than likely to encounter drones the closer you get to the hive. Unlike insects, slivers do not rely on the queen to reproduce all of the offspring of the hive. Each sliver can reproduce with any other sliver and the hive will disperse self-contained breeder bunkers as it expands to dominate more territory. They will have all sorts of mutations as they generate more individuals and absorb more and more genetic diversity from their environment, birthing venomous, flying or chameleon varieties, larger soldier types, quadruped, biped versions. As a general rule, take the base sliver drone or soldier and add traits from other creatures found in any monster manual. But there is no need to pack traits onto one sliver. The organisms share the unique abilities when they are within 60 foot telepathic range of each other. Within that 60 foot radius of effect, the slivers become engines of destruction. This is handled in the game mechanics by treating it like a cumulative series of magical auras. For example, if the swarm of 10 slivers is approached by a sliver that has absorbed the special traits of a beholder, all the slivers gain the Ice Talk Sliver Aura, where other slivers within 60 feet sprout two Ice Talks and gain eye rays um, action with a couple of beholder style optical assault beams. If the swarm then comes within 60 feet of a double headed sliver that has absorbed traits of an Etin or a Hydra, all the other slivers gain the multiple heads and reactive heads traits, growing a maximum of one extra head for a total of two heads, and their maximum total hit point is increased by 10 points. This will also double the output of their eye rays. This just gets worse and worse for any obstacle or enemy of the sliver hive. So let's take a look at a basic uh, sliver. The, in these examples by Daniel North, there's a sliver broodling that is tasked with absorbing new genetic material and biological traits from other creatures, uh, transforming into more advanced sliver variants as a result. There is also the sliver harbinger that can transform into more evolved sliver forms, kind of like a second tier, which includes the option of generating the third tier, the slive uh, the Sliver Hive Lord and other ones. There's also listings for all of these in this document. It's quite well put together. He also has included the basic Sliver Drone and Soldier. The Drone or Broodling is a small uh, class as a monstrosity. Armor class for a drone is 12 with an average of 33 hit points and a 20 foot land speed or 30 foot burrowing speed. Slivers are amorphous and can move through spaces as narrow as one inch wide without squeezing. They have a single talon attack. The drone is plus three to hit, has a five foot reach and does 1d6 plus 1 slashing damage. Soldiers are medium-sized monstrosities. They have an armor class of 15, an average of 60 hit points, 30 foot land speed, 40 foot burrowing speed. Like all slivers, they're immune to being frightened or being knocked prone unless they're biped or quadruped versions, I guess, and have tremor sense out to 60 feet. They don't normally have eyes unless that is uh, an absorbed or shared trait that they've picked up. The soldiers have the aggressive trait, which means as a bonus action, the sliver can move up to its speed towards a hostile creature. The talon attack is plus 5 to hit and does 2d6 plus 3 slashing damage. Much more fearsome. Individual slivers range from uh, 1 quarter 
to up to three challenge rating, with the Hive Lord, Overlord, and Hive Queen being way, way higher, all of them over CR11. As a campaign tool, they serve a number of different narrative roles, from lone, quirky, but not very dangerous encounters, to ever-increasing threats to a world the characters inhabit. There is any number of scenarios you could have fun with, and a couple that spring to my mind are the like the Borg from the Star Trek universe, or Aliens from the movie franchise of that name, or even the Zygons from Doctor Who. Imagine an evolutionary path that leads to a humanoid sliver race that you could play in your campaign as a player character. Anything is possible in Dungeons & Dragons. Just a reminder, if you've not subscribed already, the Hive is displeased with you. Click the subscribe button to become one with the community. Those who wish to explore the links in the description text under the video, you'll see links to my Patreon page. We can get access to all of the scripts of, for these videos. And you can see the secret campaign session, sessions that I've been recording over Discord. Anyone can join the mighty Gloostick Discord server. Great platform to chat, create game groups, uh, run video chat games with people around the world, share dank memes and discuss all things D&D, link down below, as well as links to the merchandise for the channel, plus Patron Blades. I highly recommend Patron Blades as I use them myself for a mighty smooth shave. As always, thanks for listening right to the very end. You're a champion and I'll be back with more for you very soon.